Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar series. My name is Rose Sang. I'll be moderating today's session. So as the months have gone by, the impact of COVID-19 continues to affect every business and organization. And companies are increasing scrutinized for the way they communicate and engage with employees. Amidst public angst and some sanity, companies must deploy effective internal communication efforts for confident, consistent, and transparent leadership. Communicating with employees right now is not just about giving updates. How your company responds to COVID-19 will have a lasting impact on your reputation. In times of crisis, your employees are a key stakeholder group that needs to be prioritized to demonstrate that you are committed to their ongoing health, safety, and welfare. When handled well, effective employee engagement will ensure you have a team that remains motivated to act as brand ambassadors and corporate advocates. New social distancing and working from home rules from governments have forced businesses and organizations to adapt to new technology quickly while considering how best to reorganize and retain your workforce. Change is scary for many people and business leaders need to show they are human, supportive and understanding. So to help us unpack today's topic, please welcome Paul Brello, who's the co-founder and CEO of Shortlist. He'll be speaking to us around his experience and what he's hearing from his 600 plus you know, employee clients. What are some of those tricks and tips for maintaining connection and culture when the normal in-person stuff is taken away? How are Shortlist doing it? and what he's experienced having worked abroad and now in Kenya. So please welcome Paul, who will be sharing his thoughts for us around this topic. Paul, Karibu Sana, the platform is yours. Thank you. Um, it's wonderful to be here with everyone um, here, of course, being virtual. Um, thrilled to be talking to you in part because um, I'm getting pretty lonely over here by myself. I'm sure you guys are, so some company is nice. Um, as Rose mentioned, I'm Paul. I'm the CEO uh, and co-founder of Shortlist. Um, we're going to talk about what Rose mentioned, but we're also going to talk more broadly about culture and teams. We're going to talk about how to build them when times are good but also relate that back to the moment we're in now when times are, are crazy. And this is a topic I love talking about um, in a lot of different ways. But uh, when we started Shortlist, one of the reasons we did that is because we're truly passionate about the art and the science of building great teams. And definitely a huge part of great teams is getting a, uh, the right culture and getting a sense of interconnection um, right. So obviously the art and science of making teams work has changed recently and I think we're all trying to figure that out. Uh, this is a bit of an experiment. This is going to be officially the weirdest thing I've done so far in COVID, talking to uh, nearly 200 people that I can't actually see. Um, a few kind of ground rules, warnings. First, um, it goes without saying every, t every company is different. Uh, we're going to use a lot of examples of, of things we've been trying at shortlist but, and try to bring in some other examples, but certainly acknowledging that, that what works for us may not work for other companies and vice versa. We're going to focus a lot on tools and tactics that work for digitally enabled teams. Obviously, if, if you're working in more of a blue collar or manufacturing context or retail, some of this might be different, but we're going to focus on in a world where you have a team that has access to WhatsApp, has access to uh, um, email or Slack, we're going to focus more on that. Um, goes without saying, we're students, not experts. So um, I'm hoping that you guys can use the chat function. I won't be able to see the chat without leaving the screen, but I'm gonna hopefully figure out a way that uh, perhaps uh, my teammates can send me any questions that come in. But please feel free to chat to each other, uh, make fun of me, uh, um, mention other examples you've been using that, that work. We, we, are a, we are a group of students and a group of experts who have a lot of useful insights. Please share them. Also warning, this is the first time we've talked about this publicly. There's a lot here. I have a tendency to want to just dump lots of interesting things on people and some of it will stick and some of it won't. So I'm conscious that we're going to go through a lot in the next about 40 minutes. Um, we'll probably, it'll probably take about 40 to 45 minutes and then we'll save whatever time we want uh, for questions. Um, I put my email on the bottom left corner. So if there's things we run out of time for or things you want to follow up on or you see something that we didn't get to talk about enough and you want to chat about it, 
this is how you get a hold of me. Um, so please do participate. Um, looking forward to, 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 to going through this. Very quickly, I think some of you probably know Shortlist, but Shortlist is a talent matching platform headquartered here in, in, in Nairobi. Um, we combine great recruitment software with the capabilities of a large recruitment firm. And our goal is to generate faster, better hiring results. So we both manage end-to-end -end recruitments and, and search processes for middle managers to C-suite hires. We also license our platform to SMEs to streamline job posting and candidate management, like an applicant tracking system. We also do large-scale recruitment projects with enterprises, such as graduate recruitment and, and, and things like that. Um, We've worked with a, a lot of companies. We launched in 2016. We work in both India and Kenya, which means that we already have some experience building virtual and remote teams. Um, it's been quite the experience building a team of about 85, 90 people across three offices in two quite different um, countries. Despite that, we're quite proud of our 4.9 Glassdoor rating, because after all, I don't think you should be listening to us if we can't ourselves build happy and high-performing um, teams. So we're always happy to talk shortlist. If you have questions about what we do, Doris uh, is, is, is on the line, who's our, uh, um, our, our country director. Um, I'm happy to, to receive emails, let us know. So let's, let's hop in. Um, I hope I don't even have to emphasize this. We're a, we're a, we're a group of, of HR uh, professionals and practitioners. I hope we agree, this stuff matters. Culture is indeed important. There are dozens of, or probably hundreds of different uh, reports and analyses talking about the way that culture and connection creates business results that are measurable. I include this one because Harvard is fancy and everyone seems to trust Harvard, so we can go with that one, but there are, there are dozens or hundreds of studies behind this one. I also think that this is, uh, uh, there are softer impacts as well. Um, you see companies in the US, and I just took two US examples, but um, Zappos is kind of a boring shoe internet company that has managed to attract some of the best and brightest in the world because it's renowned for its culture of delighting customers. And on the flip side, more and more big tech companies are, are in the news these days for bad things. And, and that has impacted their ability to retain top talent. But that's also impacted a very real way the ways they're getting regulatory scrutiny and, and other negative impacts. So there are some real consequences to good and bad. Uh, culture. I also think, and, and this is maybe another softer dimension, culture is what your team will remember when they someday leave the company. Um, this, is, this is how you make people feel. And I think it's important for us as HR professionals to, to, to think about that purpose and meaning behind our work uh, and, and the role we have to play to make sure that people's experience of our companies are special. Okay, so what is culture? And this is like, we're not gonna go into a long discussion here. How we think about it at short list, we don't think about it as the parties, we don't think about it as games or ping pong or health benefits, it's not your mission statement, it's not something you get to write down once and then like forget all about. Culture is really at, at base about how people make decisions and how they act. It's kind of like that invisible hand that's guiding behavior and guiding how people feel about things and, and, and how they behave in particular circumstances. And it's important to realize it can change without your permission. And right now, when we all are spread apart, there's a greater risk than ever that culture might be changing without our permission and maybe not even without our immediate knowledge. If you're, even if your value statements and your code of conduct says one thing, if people act against that too many times without you doing something about it, without like people saying something about it, calling people on it, well, that's your new culture. And that's a tone that usually needs to get set by top management, but it's something that needs to be maintained and protected and built by the whole company. And I really do believe that as HR professionals, we are really one of the most important stewards of how that culture gets built and maintained at our company. So, I'm gonna use as one framework, one of my favorite books on the topic of culture. It's this book called The Culture Code. And this is a book that we have read and discussed many times amongst our leadership team, among our broader team. And I think it gives a pretty good framework for what makes a good team function. And this author, Daniel Coyle, was focused on the question of why are some teams better than the sum of their parts, and some teams are worse. And it's kind of an interesting frame for, for what we're doing. Um, and he kind of breaks it down into, into three ideas. Um, first, this idea of building psychological safety. 
Second, this idea of sharing vulnerability. And third, this idea of establishing purpose. So we're gonna take a look at each of these, both within the science of how this works in the normal world, um, and I'm gonna have some examples and things like that, because I do think that even in the normal world, we all have work to do. I, I'm sure all of us, I certainly feel that um, we haven't gotten this figured out. We can do a lot more even once we all return to our offices, but there's some unique dimensions and challenges and opportunities as we shift into a uh, virtual world. Um, and so we're gonna be talking through some of the, the, uh, the science and the insights, but also uh, some of the tools and ideas that you might experiment with in this crazy time we live in. So looking first at this idea of safety, and I'm not sure if you can see in the upper right-hand corner or whether my image is blocking it, but I'll kind of keep track of where we are, safety, vulnerability, uh, um, um, purpose as we go through. So one example that kind of was an interesting experiment, Google, who has, of course, limitless money and limitless resources, um, have been really interested in how you build high-performing teams. And they've invested millions of US dollars trying to research what makes teams work. Um, and, and I think they have a ton of data across a big global organization. Their initial, they, they really struggle to figure out any commonalities across good teams versus bad teams. They were initially focused a lot on who was in the teams. They were looking at who are the individuals, where did they go to school, what experience did they have, um, but they were realizing they weren't finding any patterns. And ultimately, they shifted to looking at how the teams were working. And they found a couple of things that jumped out at them. Um, first, and this is going to sound crazy, but first, one of the things that predicted whether teams would be successful and work well together was, did people talk about the same amount? They found that in the best teams, people talked about the same amount. In other words, there's this equality in how people took turns talking and that it might not be the same for every conversation but at the end of the day or the week you'd see that roughly whether you were the boss or the, the lowest person you were talking about equally that's kind of an interesting finding across uh, some a company as, as big and, and successful as google second people paid attention to each other's emotion so they found that the good teams had higher social sensitivity they could read someone's emotions just from their eyes. And as they, as they dug into this, they, they uncovered that these were two big indicators of this idea of psychological safety, this idea of confidence that the team will not embarrass, will not reject, punish anyone for speaking up. Um, and that underpins a lot of what makes teams successful. And it's something that's even harder to get right at a moment where we're not sitting across the table from each other. It's very hard, hard to read people's body language, very hard to, to, to look them in the eyes and know what's going on. Another bit of science is this, is this guy Pentland who put these sociometers in the middle of tables of teams who are working together. And like 10 times a second, it would process different little bits of information like who was talking, the percent of people talking, number of interruptions, energy level of the voices, um, vocal patterns, things like that. And basically what he found after all of that work were kind of confirming a lot of what Google found. People talk and listen equally. There's eye contact, people are energetic. They don't talk to the leader. I don't know if any of you have had this experience where you're in a meeting and whoever's the highest ranking person in the room is the one everyone talks to. They don't do that. That's a bad thing. And in fact, I know when I see that in my teams happening, I try to get them to you know, talk to the person who asked the question, not to me. But it's interesting how these dynamics shape so much or predict so much of whether teams are going to be successful. Um, and one more a quick example um, is, is thinking about how we respond to these threshold moments as we're starting to move from one thing to another or like move into a job. Um, Wipro is a big BPO in uh, India. And um, um, they were seeing that they bring in lots and lots of people every, every year, but um, a lot of them would leave very quickly. So they have this high churn challenge. Um, and I think they were, they were curious whether they could reshape this onboarding process to impact things. So they had two, two kind of groups. Group one, they just kind of did a normal good onboarding. They, they, they had a good session engaging about what the company did. They talked about the mission, what the job was. Um, and at the end of all this the normal onboarding, they get a cool sweatshirt and it has the Wipro logo on it. And that's great. And people were happy. Group two, they did that, but then they had an extra 15 minutes. And in that extra 15 minutes, 
there were some questions about the specific individual's personal bests, the things they were most proud of, and specifically getting them to think about how their skills or accomplishments would help Wipro over time and help the person succeed at the company. And then at the end, they got a sweatshirt with that Wipro logo, but they also got, a, uh, um, uh, they also got their names embroidered on it. Not a big deal. You wouldn't think that this impacts much, except they saw that seven months later, group two were two and a half times more likely to still be working there, which is kind of incredible. Incredible. So what's going on here? Um, the, the theory is that not, the group two got flooded with belonging cues. They got made to feel a strong sense of belonging at a critical moment. At that moment, they were entering this company thinking about, do I belong here? Are these people I want to work with? And what was special about these particular cues was first they were individualized. They very much focused on this particular person's, their best, their name, their future oriented. They got them kind of imagining what that future would be. And they were amygdala activating. They were getting their like almost reptilian brain engaged at this emotional level. And what was, what was really cool is people don't even remember this. If you ask the people who went through this experience, do you remember your onboarding? No, not really. This is almost happening at a subconscious um, level. Okay, so this is all nice and good, right? Like there's, there's all these different cool things you can do when, when things are great. But we're in this moment right now where things are different. Um, people are facing unprecedented fear, uncertainty, loneliness. They're unfamiliar with some of the approaches they have. You can't rely on body language as much. Even if you use video, that is still compromised. And you, you can't rely on just bumping into people in the office to have quick conversations or have those little doses of humanity. If you're not intentional about these things, they don't happen. And I'm seeing it with my team. I'm seeing it with myself very much. I'm finding myself at the end of days much, much more exhausted rather than energized. When I would typically go into our office, you know, we're at ABC Place and, and it'd be bouncing around and I'm in meetings and I'd go get coffee at Java and, and, and really excited about the day. And, and I'd kind of end the day ready to go and ready to do more. And I'm, I'm finding very honestly at the end of these days now, I'm exhausted. And I, and I just want to go to sleep or just want to turn on Netflix or something. This is a real thing that we're all going through um, that, that we've got to adapt to and we've got to be intentional about, intentional about it. So um, some of the easy stuff um, at, at base, know that for psychological safety, even when we're remote, people want to know that they're being taken care of. They want to be that know, known they're getting heard. They want to be acknowledged as whole people. Starts with simple stuff like, um, um, making sure people have what they need to, to work and have what they need to be healthy. Um, I know that we uh, had our, our um, HR teams in, in both India and Kenya um, actually call every single person. Are you healthy? Have you been exposed to anyone? Is there anything on your mind? Is there anything that you're, you're having trouble with um, um, right now? Um, we try to start most meetings with a mood check, just a simple question of how are you doing and emphasizing that we don't just mean how are you doing with work? Are you getting your work done? But how are you doing personally? How's your family doing? Um, I think that's really important. And I think all of us are craving that kind of engagement and attention right now. And I think that we can embrace the fact that we are all in home and we have never been more holistic in how we show up at work since work is home. And so whereas I think in the past, it would have been very embarrassing um, to have like to be on a video call and have like your kids in the background. And I don't know if anyone has um, seen this video, but it's terrific. I strongly encourage you to Google BBC interview man with baby. Um, but this guy, you know, he's sitting there. This is his moment of fame. He's got his tie on. He's on BBC. He's live. You can tell he set up his bedroom to look like he's really smart. He's got this map. He's got these fancy books. He's in his fancy tie. He gets on, gets on BBC and then his kids just invade. And, it, and what follows is a, is a really humorous um, 30 seconds of awkwardness where the guy doesn't quite know how to respond and, and someone comes in to pull the, pull the kids out. Um, this was crazy and unusual. Um, just a month or two ago, but this has become the new normal. Um, and I think that uh, um, I would encourage people to embrace it. Tell your bosses, tell your teammates, it's okay if your kids are in the background. It's okay if your kids come say hello. Um, it's okay to, to introduce uh, people to your, to your pet. Um, show them your favorite mug. Um, 
this won't work for every culture. I get it. I know some cultures are, are a bit more formal, but finding ways to humanize each other at this time when we all desperately want to be human, I think is really, really important. Uh, and, and it's key to making work from home work. So how do we do this? Um, um, very simple, but like first, first things first, let's try our best to use video. Um, I'll be honest, this is still a battle with my team. Um, I, I, my team and I, myself, we all are having Wi-Fi problems, bandwidth problems. No question this is, this, is, this is challenging, but to the extent it's possible, try to get on video. Even when we've been doing all hands across all the offices with our 85 plus employees, um, we're still trying to get these tiled views. And I can't tell you how different it feels. Like even right now, I know there's a lot of people on, but it'd be magical to be able to see little uh, um, um, pin-sized pictures of all of you and know that you can kind of like dip in and see what's up with particular people. Um, video really lets us create these more synchronous conversations. It lets you see body language. It lets you see facial expression. It also promotes diversity and inclusion because you know there's a lot of quiet people that have things to say that in a meeting, you might be able to tell they want to speak up, but, but, but you know, haven't gotten the nerve to. Um, um, at least with video, you might be able to see that. Whereas uh, if you just depend on someone interrupting into these awkward, paused uh, uh, voice calls, sometimes you, you exclude those people. So using video, I think, is, is great, though not without its challenges. We've also been having a lot of luck with WhatsApp. Um, we've been kind of starting conversations typically once every day or two that people can then dip into or pull out of. Um, and here's like, here's just one example of uh, um, Eva on our team kind of put out the call for what's your favorite workout or motivational song. And then over the next two or three hours, it didn't have to be right at that moment, people are just kind of contributing their ideas and it contributed to this shared built playlist. That's kind of cool. Um, um, I, haven't, I haven't made my way all the way through this yet, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm looking for, for, uh, forward to it. So I think we've been able to do that across a number of different types of questions. And some are, some are more silly and fun, just a way to create a sense of connection and, and safety. Others are, are, are more personal and, and, and take people into more uh, vulnerable places. And we'll talk about that um, in, a, in a second. Um, if you guys have been doing things like this on WhatsApp, on Slack, and you want to um, uh, share um, on those examples, please throw them into the, the chat, um, I think. And, and, and frankly, this is just one possible format for this. I'd love to hear from you guys in the chat if you're doing other things, like you're, you're uh, um, having meetings that focus on, on this or, 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 or coffee dates or, or things like that, because I do think there's different things we can uh, um, uh, learn from all of you guys and different things we can try. Um, I, I, I can't see the chat, so I'm just going to pause for a quick second. Are there questions or comments so far? Cool. I'll rely on someone, um, on maybe Rose or someone, if you want to just like uh, take yourself off mute and interrupt me, if you see anything pressing or um, um, that comes up in the chat, just let me know. I'll just we'll keep do. on going. Yeah, we'll do. Go on. Great. So let's talk about vulnerability. And this is a, a kind of a strange topic. And, and vulnerability has become one of these buzzwords um, since I think Brene Brown has a very popular TED talk um, um, where she goes through this. But really, um, um, this idea of being able to be exposed and admit you don't have all the answers can be really powerful but also really difficult to generate in a, in a remote virtual team setting. Um, I'm curious if people saw this article, I guess it was in 2015, it looks like, but um, um, ba basically this New York Times article suggested it might be possible to sit down with a stranger, go through and answer 36 questions, look into each other's eyes silently for four minutes and voila, you are in love. Uh, sounds a little bit crazy. I admit it. I, I'm sure all of you have now jumped to New York Times to uh, um, 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 Google this and try to figure out what the heck was going on here. But it's kind of interesting. There was some evidence that people introduced at random, got into serious relationships, and some even got married after doing this exercise. So what's going on here? It's not a, people are not getting brainwashed. They're not getting like uh, 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 manipulated, but they're, they're activating this very deep concept of a, of a vulnerability loop. 
Um, in this case, one person answers an intimate question and the questions kind of start off simple, but then get more and more intimate as you go. That person in answering that question, they feel vulnerable. And then the magic comes and happen, what happens next. So does the second person shut that down and make the first person feel silly? That will tear them apart. And that will make, that will, that will make it harder to regain trust and, 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 and regain a kind of uh, um, functioning as, in, as a unit that you want in a team. But what happens if the person responds and answers with if intimacy and vulnerability of their own? And I think what happens then is the connection is strengthened. And this is the idea of a vulnerability loop. The first person sends a vulnerability signal. I'm, 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 I'm answering this question. Second person receives it. The second person kind of sends this vulnerability signal back. The first person receives it. And then this norm is established and closeness and trust increase. And if you do that 36 times, the idea is those people start to think like a unit. They just start to feel very safe. They start to feel like they can uh, understand and trust uh, each other. And that improves their ability, not just to fall in love, but to work together in, in better ways. Sounds crazy. I know we're not trying to um, love. This is a, um, you know, I think we did a both sides debate on romance in the office before. So for any of you who went to that, that's a whole separate topic um, we can talk about. But let's talk about it. Um, how does this actually work in a virtual context? So back to the magic of WhatsApp. And you can tell we're a team that loves WhatsApp. Um, but we're seeing this every day in, in our WhatsApp channel. So this is one example. Um, someone shares, um, um, if you could put one thing in your back, backpack as you travel that has special meaning to you, what would it be? And there could be, and there, I think there were, some silly answers, of course. But someone volunteered a, a quite personal one, um, sharing how they carry always a locket with their godchildren in it. And that is absolutely a kind of vulnerability signal that got put out to our team. Now, in theory, people could have ignored it. They could have, they could have teased her about it. But instead, what came back was even more personal. Another, another uh, colleague shared about a last gift that she received from her father um, one year before her father passed. And when that happens, that not only brings those two people closer together, but it brings the team closer together. Their signals understood that this is a team where we can share things, where we can, where we can be weak, where we can be exposed, where we can be wrong, and that, and that can be okay. So, I mean, things like this, even though it's WhatsApp, I don't know about other people on my team, but at the end of this evening where a whole bunch of interesting questions came in, I had tears in my eyes. I mean, this is very kind of like emotional. And even though we're all in our own houses spread out across a couple countries, I felt probably more close to the team um, than ever. Another example of just like day, daily practices. Um, um, some of you might, might know Maggie Mashira, who leads our executive, um, uh, executive search practice. And, and Maggie's got this, she's got two people on her team. So she's got a more small team. And one of the things we did was kind of say to, the, say to our leaders, run your meetings how you want, like run your teams how you want. All of our little pockets of teams are different. So if you wanna do a structured daily standup, that's okay. If you wanna do other more informal things, that's okay. So what Maggie has started doing is every day she literally eats lunch with her team. She has a coffee break with her team. Like they, as best I can tell, actually sit down on video and go through and just chit chat like they would sitting around the table um, during the day. Um, and on Fridays, and I love this name, I'm sorry for the colorfulness, but they do a session she calls Popsicles and Poopsicles. And the naming itself is kind of silly, and it, I'm, I'm sure many of you are smiling right now, but the idea is intended, and the naming actually intentionally makes it kind of fun and silly, and it invites people to open up about what really went on, the good, the bad, the ugly. So finding ways to create spaces where it's not always super serious, but you are finding ways to genuinely share what's on your mind and, and, and what's going on. So those are a couple of ideas around vulnerability. There's a whole lot more science and examples and things like that, but finding ways where people feel comfortable expressing those sorts of things, I think is really important at this time when we wanna be heard, we wanna be human. So moving on to purpose. And a lot of people think about purpose as like, how are we gonna save the world? Are we, are we solving climate change? Are we solving poverty? And that, those, are, those are great big purposes, but Let's be honest, a lot of our day-to-day -day purposes are smaller. They're more about helping a particular uh, uh, person or getting a particular thing done that will kind of um, prove to yourself that you could accomplish something. And so thinking through the ways we can establish purpose. Um, one of my favorite 
examples of a form of purpose building that happens in the real world or is with schools of fish. And you've probably all seen images or maybe, you, maybe some of you have snorkeled or scuba dived and you see these fish swimming in this tight formation. And I don't know how many of you actually wondered, like, how do they actually do this? And I hate to spoil this for you, but there's no CHRO or CEO or anyone else sitting in the middle of that ball of fish kind of pointing who goes where. It is not a top-down structure at all. It's what um, is actually called an emergent biological system. Um, and, it's, and it's formed, scientists think, through the internalization um, or the genetics, perhaps, of a few different simple rules. So if you think about it, like, for example, rules that might be encoded in those little fish brains are swim as close as you can to the fish next to you. If you see food, swim towards it. If you see danger, swim away from it. And if the fish actually follows those three rules pretty well, they're going to be doing some amazing magical things. And they're going to be able to think as a group in a way that uh, isn't otherwise possible. So that's great for fish. Um, I think there's a number of ways that, that uh, people have turned this into uh, um, a fascinating business practice as well. There's lots of stories of leaders who, as their companies are growing, they use narratives and they use simple phrases to encapsulate those narratives that then can activate action at a distance among their team in ways that can be really powerful. Because one of the challenges companies have is even when you're not there, how do you make sure people are, are, are prioritizing the right things, are doing the right things? That challenge is even harder when people are not sitting in front of you in the office when they're not getting day-to-day -day direction, when they're not seeing the body language of their teammates around particular issues. So one of the ways, this is super silly, but is to think more about what are those principles that are important. Um, you can only, you know, there's this, uh, the Twitterverse has, has popularized the notion of hashtags. You could turn these into hashtags, these little phrases of things that mean something. And it's, it's not enough and it's not very useful if you just create a catchphrase or a simple rule or a hashtag that doesn't have any meaning. But then the work becomes, how do you actually make sure that there are stories and examples behind these things so that I might be able to just write in hashtag whole person into WhatsApp and it kind of triggers a burst of priorities and, and, and ideas in my team, even if I'm not sitting in front of them. And I think this is a weird kind of tool to, to how we can like use slogans or catchphrases to, to establish some sense of purpose. There's also, of course, bigger um, um, senses of purpose. So um, I think that uh, um, um, one of the things that we talk a lot about at Shortlist is our why. And that why can be answered with a question of our mission and our company mission from before we started, before we had a name, before we were Shortlist, has always been unlock professional potential. We've always been oriented towards the idea that there's untapped potential in the markets that we work in for people to be their best professional, how can we help make that happen? And as you guys know from our business model, a lot of that right now is how do we help companies build their teams better? How do we make sure they select the right people? They look at the broadest set of people. They look at the right details. So they're not just looking at the CV. They look at other things. But for us, that unlocked professional potential um, um, has a, was a big one. But we also do that question of why at, a, at an individual level. We look at the uh, particular um, um, drivers and motivations of the team. And like, we're big on journaling. So we're a team that tends to like uh, uh, very often in, in a meeting when we're trying to grapple with something fuzzy, we'll just sit down and have people take three to five minutes and, and almost stream of consciousness right. And we've done many exercises where we'll ask people like, well, why shortlist? Particularly at a leadership level, well, why shortlist? And of course, part of it's to make money. I get it, but part of it's also probably something else. For me, there, there's a desire to, to, to learn how to be a, a better leader and entrepreneur. I'd never started a company before. I wanted to learn that. There was the opportunity to work with people I love. I started this company with two of my very best friends. That was a unique opportunity. So there was like different things influencing our why. So there's a lot of ways to think about how do you find your why in this crazy time? One of the things we experimented with, and, and this, this was very creatively led by uh, um, Alana on our team, 
I did not think this was going to work. I thought this was a little bit crazy, but this worked really well. So what we did is we ran a virtual hackathon. We essentially got a bunch of people, over 40 people joined this. They got on video, they broke into remote teams, and we basically asked them broadly, how can Shortlist best respond to this crisis? And we were looking for kind of a couple of things. One was, of course, like, would we get amazing ideas? Like, that would be cool. Um, and in fact, we did. I'll share a couple of, of kind of ideas that came out of this. But there's also a desire to get people engaged with the problem, um, thinking through, like, like wh why does shortlist exist? So let's suppose, as, as we were probably seeing, that more and more people go on hiring freezes or slow down. We're a recruitment company. What does that do to us? But reconnecting to the fact that we're more than a recruiting company. We're genuinely trying to think about unlocking professional potential. How can we help? So a couple ideas that came out of it. One, we, we, uh, we realized that this is a moment when both there's a lot of challenges faced by certain pockets of our, our, of our market, of, our, of, our, of, our, uh, um, of India, of Kenya right now, that people do need more help getting the right people. Um, so we've launched this effort. Um, uh, this is a um, shortlist.net slash COVID response. But this is basically a place where we're trying to mobilize health workers and mobilize workers for other critical services. We launched it with about 25 companies. We were able to build this and launch this and get all the partners on um, in about eight days. Um, and I'm kind of proud of that. This is also a place that is serving as a hub that will start building out to help companies going through other things. We'd love to be able to connect HR directors who are maybe still hiring with those who may be downsizing so that people can actually just talk to each other and make sure that people are getting the softest landing possible as inevitably there will be probably some, some, some layoffs or redundancies or things happening depending on how the Employment Act uh, um, unfolds. So I think this was one example we are proud of. Another example is we just decided, you know, we've got great software that can help not only companies hiring, but this shortlist connect uh, um, um, product that we've built also just helps companies think through their employer brands, think through the employer value proposition and communicate that out to the world so that at a moment when a lot of young people and a lot of candidates and job seekers are actually at home clicking around, searching for what's next, um, this could be the moment where you actually raise your employer visibility. We have a community of, of in, in Kenya, uh, nearly 400,000 um, young professionals on this platform a great moment to kind of make sure people know you're out there and start to build a pipeline for the future, even if you're not hiring right now. So we just decided, let's just make this free for now. Um, at some point, again, we hope to charge, of course, but for now, if you're interested, get in touch. We'd be happy just to set you up and, and, and have you use it in, in our interest in just kind of creating value, making sure that companies and, and young people, and, and, and sorry, not young people, um, professionals are able to, to meet and talk most efficiently. So those were a few ideas. Um, we, we, we were talking about like, like a lot of things and I am wrapping up, I promise. Um, I probably got about less than five minutes. Um, I think that uh, um, um, high level, um, the way that we think about culture at Shortlist interplay, that's kind of reinforcing between the values you set and you write down, and those are important. Probably much more important are the behaviors. How do people actually decide things? How do they actually act? And then, of course, the, the team dynamics. And kind of what we've been talking about today is more centered on the team dynamics. How do you create, like it's not company specific, but in general, it's a prediction of performance to have people feel safe, feel vulnerable, feel uh, or, or feel comfortable expressing vulnerability and, and feeling a sense of purpose. In general, those predict performance. And so we've talked about how do we do that in this new world? Um, but I also think that it's, it's, it's this idea of doing it consistently. And this is one of the challenges that all of us are going to have as the world continues to get turned upside down. It's not enough to kind of do something once and be done with it. So think about working out. I wish this wasn't true, but you're not gonna get in shape if you just go to the gym once and work out really hard for five hours and then you don't do anything else for a month. Sadly, it doesn't work that way. Same with uh, brushing your teeth. Um, good luck if you try to just brush your teeth once for two hours and then you don't do it again for six months. You're going to have problems. I think culture and teams, um, people often try to manage 
with intensity. They try to man manage by uh, having a retreat or they sit down one time and they write their values out or they, or they do a reorg. I think uh, companies love doing reorgs as a way to kind of like fix things. Those are kind of seductive and make you think, yeah, yeah, we can, we can change things. But I would urge you as, you as you think about these practices that you might, you might adopt directly with your teams, you might encourage your organizations, you might talk to your leadership about this. Um, think about doing things consistently. It's about the little things. It's about doing those little things over and over again every day. Can you afford to miss a day? Probably. Can you afford to miss six months? Probably not. So think about this idea of, 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 of through this period, and we don't know if this period is going to be one month or, or six months or, or longer or shorter, but people are going to be craving consistency because consistency breeds clarity, it breeds safety, and it creates this fertile ground for vulnerability and this sense of belonging that, that is really important to teams um, working at their best. So I'm going to stop there. I will probably um, go off of screen share so I can see some of the comments. But um, 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 I think we'll, 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 we'll end there. I would love whether it's uh, people, uh, I, this is my first time here. I hope not my last, but uh, I really appreciate you guys having us. I don't know how it works now, whether you guys kind of um, will just kind of join and unmute yourselves or, 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 or we'll kind of have a bit of a discussion and, 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 and ideas being shared via the chat. But thanks so much for, for, for letting me uh, chat with you guys. Thank you, Paul. Wonderful presentation. The comments are coming in first. Um, so just a few questions uh, that we've been able to collate as you are making your presentation. Now, this is Africa. And in Africa, men and perhaps ladies are sort of vulnerability is not our key strength. So how do we encourage um, CEOs or senior leadership, um, you know, to be vulnerable without necessarily exposing themselves so that then they're doing it within a safe space? Yeah, it's a great question without an easy answer. And I think that as more and more science uh, gets presented that vulnerability really does lead to better team functioning. It, it creates more openness about ideas coming from anywhere. It leads to a culture where um, leadership can be challenged. And let's be honest, leadership does need to get challenged uh, um, um, very often. Um, it, it, is, it, is, uh, uh, it is not just a Kenyan um, culture challenge. It's really more traditional business as a whole. Um, I don't know that there's an easy answer. I think there's, there's two ideas that um, we've talked about with clients in the past. Um, one, one is, uh, leading with data. I think often the people that are maybe most resistant to this idea, and it sounds fuzzy, and I don't know about that, that's just not my style. Um, often those are off people who consider themselves kind of data-driven scientists. Um, and so it's best to maybe lead with more of the data around what, both um, the fact that this has been shown across a huge number of contexts to predict and improve team performance, but also getting into a little bit of the mechanisms of why and how, like what I mentioned about um, um, more ideas getting shared, more challenge when someone needs to speak up, but maybe might be af afraid to. So that's one, leading with data. The other is thinking about it more in baby steps. If you have a, uh, uh, and I know this is probably often men in these positions, but not exclusively, uh, but if, if you've got someone in a, in a leadership role that's maybe afraid of this concept, um, you can, you can stay away from words like vulnerability and talk more about, um, um, and I know that lots of you are in roles where you're kind of like, you're, you're, you're probably all coaches to your C-suite and to your CEOs. Um, and that might be one of your most important functions in, in some ways. But I think it's, it's maybe staying away from the words that are likely to trigger them rolling their eyes and focus more on um, specific behaviors that might be less scary. Um, like, like just uh, um, um, opening up to questions and, um, and suggesting that like this would be a good moment to, to mention that we don't know the answer to this yet, but we would, we're, we're going to be soliciting opinions. Um, and generally taking those baby steps towards a place where um, first, initially, leadership can admit we don't have all the answers. It's less about being emotionally vulnerable and it's more about being strategically vulnerable. And I think that's maybe a slightly safer space to start inviting, oh, 
my, my leadership is human. They're, 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 they're not invincible. They, they have issues. So I think like taking those baby steps is another angle. It's something, um, it's a great question. I'd love to think more about it. Um, and uh, um, uh, I'll see if, if anyone has any other ideas, please share in the, uh, um, in, in the comments. Cause I do think there's been more and more research and writing on this lately. All right, thanks for that. There's a question around purpose. And a lot of the times people confuse purpose with vision, with mission. Um, what are your thoughts around steps towards finding purpose within an organization? How does one go about it? Yeah, um, I think there's a, there's a couple things. By the way, I, I, someone I see, I'm now, comments are visible, which is great. Um, and I like that someone said, the other obvious thing is just lead with vulnerability yourself. Like I said, there's a natural norm of reciprocity where people want to respond the way they got responded to. So as scary as that might be, um, I wouldn't go overboard, but leading, leading with uh, vulnerability yourself might spark some of those early baby steps quite well. Um, so establishing purpose. I, I think this is, a, um, this is a complicated one. There's some companies where the purpose naturally screens out and you can, you can, you almost get to cheat a bit because like you're distributing food um, um, to Kibera or you're providing health services to, to people who um, um, are lower income and don't have access or, or things like that. Um, that's great. And if, you, if, you, if your company is doing one of those naturally purposeful activities, then great, you should talk about it and you should find ways to make sure that everyone across the organization, whether you're an office manager or, or the CEO, you're finding ways on a, on a day-to-day -day basis to connect to that. But I think that purpose often um, stems from more human interactions. And so um, it's asking people their personal why. And this sounds fuzzy, but I do think there's ways even in meetings where um, without getting into journaling, if that sounds funny or, or not a good idea, um, you could just kind of ask people about um, their highlights from the day. You can, you can structure what things get celebrated. So we, we have a, uh, uh, in Kenya, it's beating a drum and in, and in India, it's ringing a bell. But we kind of like, we'll have mini little ceremonies when good things happen. And for us as a recruitment firm, one of those good business outcomes is when a company makes a hire and somebody gets a job. That's great. But we also can ring the bell if we got, a, got a, an, an employer to consider a candidate they wouldn't have usually because we think they're, they've got a lot of potential, even though their CVs aren't that strong. Or we might, we might um, do this um, when, we, when we realize that um, um, we've been able to make an impact on how someone thinks about um, culture. Um, or we've been able to do that when a candidate writes us in something about how they felt more empowered by our application process. So those are ways where you're kind of making sure you have control over what you shine a spotlight on and shining the spotlight on the things where like, oh yeah, that's why we do this. This isn't just about like chasing money or whatever. We're doing it because of this other thing. And then just trying it wherever you are in the organization, and this is something you could sit down and do with individual people, mapping out what parts of their jobs are most likely to create the highest points of meaning and making sure you're helping their brains make the link between the work that they do and whatever that positive impact is. So no matter what that role is, so let's say, um, um, you know, our recruiters, um, our recruiters, and it's, it can be a tough job. They're often spending a lot of time like talk, like, like talking to a lot of candidates who maybe aren't as interested in the role or, or, or maybe uh, um, are frustrated and, and down. Um, and it can feel like, oh, I just need to get through these calls so I can make sure I can send some great candidates to my, to my client. But we want people to realize, no, that's where the, that's where the purpose happens. Um, that purpose happens when you're in those calls because those are the, that's your interface with, with, a, with a real person in the market that's, that's struggling to find a job. And so helping people make those links the last thing I'll say is just the power of narrative. Um, we are, we are uh, um, human, human, human beings have this need for stories and our, our, our brains can understand stories so much faster than, than just facts or ideas. And so being able to tell powerful stories as a leader is something that can scale even if uh, um, 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 beyond just you. And so thinking through those stories of impact that people can connect to that feel real, I think is, is, is another way. So it's less about big save the world things and it's more about how do you bring meaning to, to the day to day. Okay, all right. So a lot of 
questions around culture, um, the comments are that, you know, the tips that you've shared are great, exciting, but seem more ideal to organizations that have invested in building an open culture. So with the current situation where you have remote working, um, how do you begin to, be, to build that culture of openness and dialogue and engagement, given that a lot of the people are not within the office and the circumstances are now forcing you to move that direction? It's a great question. And I don't know that I have an answer. The, f- the first thing that comes to my mind is thinking thinking in baby steps and thinking in baby steps in a couple of ways. First, thinking in baby steps by not asking people to the next day jump in with, with deeply vulnerable stories about um, um, uh, their family and things like that on a big WhatsApp channel, but finding smaller things that people can share. Um, creating a survey that starts off as maybe anonymous, but then is more um, um, slightly uh, um, asking for other kinds of feedback and then sharing that feedback with people's permission on their behalf and starting to get almost like force a bit of the conversation, even if at first step, it is more about sharing one-to-one conversations in a certain way, but not jumping in the deep end there. The other baby steps is starting in smaller teams and smaller units. So um, if it wouldn't make sense to do this uh, um, at, a, at a macro company level, um, you may find that it's easier to just have an open conversation about this in smaller groups. So that could happen at a, at a team-by-team basis. So, um, um, and, and if, the le- if the leaders of those teams don't seem like they're the right facilitators or they're, or they're not that way, could be that HR steps in and HR says, hey, we want to try an experiment. I want to just have a conversation with this team. And it could be smaller just groups that are randomly composed. And then if you got those groups together, I, I personally, and this might be a personal style thing, but I would want to talk relatively openly about what kind of team do we want to build? What, um, um, what like, 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 wouldn't it be more fun if we talked about these things or just start the conversation? Be like, this, this, is, this is a period where we're going to come together and, 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 just, and just chat about some of the things that are on our mind. Where is a team um, need to answer these questions? Um, um, let's get going. Um, and almost creating like a shared project. That was kind of like, like our hackathon is something that um, uh, um, could possibly, I'm not sure actually, but it could possibly work for a team that is not used to just jumping into sharing their personal sides, but might be open and in fact might really want to find some place where they can be very practical and helpful and, and like work on actual problems. And so framing it around a particular problem um, um, could help. But I, I like high level, there's no quick fix, right? This is the thing that um, comes back to intensity. I wish there was a way, you know, you can use a thing like a retreat or you can do a focus group and that might kickstart something. But the key is really just to kind of get particularly the leaders to act the way that they need to on a regular, consistent basis. Um, um, and I think it's the kind of thing that norms can change. And, and people talk about, um, uh, what is it? Uh, um, forming, norming, storming. Uh, I can't even remember the, the, the phrases, but they can change. But it normally doesn't happen overnight. I'd be happy to chat more with folks if, 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 if you want to brainstorm, because it's not, there's, there's, no, there's no easy answer that I'm aware of. Okay. Handling conflict remotely. I guess it's easier when it's face-to-face. Um, how do we manage that when you can't see somebody on the other side, but then you must have difficult conversations? Yeah. Um, Rose, am I allowed to like uh, uh, call a lifeline? Um, I'm sure there's so many people in the audience that probably have great answers um, to that. I think um, on, on our side, um, um, and certainly there, there, there have been and will need to be tough conversations uh, in, the, in the coming months about lots of different things. Um, I, I would prefer to be doing those conversations over video so you can still have some window into body language and how things are being received. Um, I know that the way I communicate, uh, I'm normally kind of adapting in real time based on what, what I'm seeing um, from the other person in terms of what's registering, what's not registering. And I think that is really compromised um, in this current moment. So I think uh, if you do video, great. I think that um, 
spending more time than you normally, if you're doing it just by phone or, or WhatsApp or something, spending more time than you normally would uh, trying to, to, as best you can, get at feelings and how people feel about something and making sure that they understand. So I, 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 I'm just thinking out loud here, but I would probably spend more time um, um, confirming that someone understood me probably I would more often ask, can you play that back for me? I just want to make sure that, uh, that, 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 that we got that. Um, I'd probably, um, um, with, within reason, I would probably try to just really ask, rather than rely on, on trusting like nonverbal communication, ask people, how, to, how, to, how do you feel about that? Like, what is that bringing up for you? Um, one of the principles that have helped, that has helped both our co-founder relationship among my kind of co-founders, but also in the leadership team is this idea of getting to empty. Um, and it's this idea that when we're having conversations, particularly hard conversations and particularly conflict, there's a tendency as humans to try to minimize that and try to pull out early and try to say, okay, okay, we're fine. Let's move on. But I think what we've said is like, Hey, once we're, once we're in those conflict modes, let's go all the way. Let's make sure that like a gas tank, we're getting to empty. And some of the ways that we do that is if you're receiving tough feedback or conflict is, is asking, like, is there more? Is there more? Like, Thank you for that. Um, is, is there more? Um, and, and trying to continue to pull um, um, more out so that there are not things left unsaid. And on the receiving end, you've got to, I mean, I, this is not, there's a lot of different kinds of conflict, but sometimes conflict comes up in forms of feedback conversations. And um, I think that uh, um, um, one, of the, one of the things we have actually written out in our values is feedback is a gift. Um, we really want our team and, and, and really want uh, all of us to think about when someone is giving us feedback, um, it's, not, it's not a bad thing or it sh doesn't need to be a bad thing. Um, there's, a, there's a mindset about that where this could be a really good thing where um, someone is actually doing you a favor of letting you know something you may not have realized or may not know. Um, and and you, can, you can maybe ignore that if you want, and that's fine, but um, it's at least a gift that was given to you and you can accept it or, or, or not. Um, I'm curious, uh, I'm, I'm, it's, it's hard for me to um, monitor the, um, all the awesome chats, but I, were there any um, great ideas that came, that came in about, about how, to, how to perfect the art of conflict? in the time of COVID? I'm open to ideas. Um, I think people, have, you know, sort of have just shared a few of the experiences. Yeah. Uh, you know, just saying a face-to-face, -face, like you said, a video would, would work within the circumstance. Um, others felt that a face-to-face -face, uh, would be better. So I guess different yeah. views have to handle it. But yep. with a new normal, I guess technology will have to play a key part in yep. it all. For sure. I know we're coming to the end. And so just one last question before um, we can have the closing remarks. And this is around your experience as uh, CEO, having managed remote teams, both locally and, and out of country. How do you monitor performance of the team? We have not figured that out yet. Uh, but I think at a highest level, we do our best to manage to results, not uh, activities. Um, obviously, there's, there's part of management that wants to make sure you're getting, getting the best out of people and, and getting their best work. But at the end of the day, I think uh, um, as a leader, and this is actually something I very much struggle with. I probably have some of my um, colleagues on the phone, but I think I can get better at the art of knowing what you want and asking for it clearly. And I think that if as leaders, we're doing a good job knowing what we want and asking for it clearly, then the metric should be, is it getting done? And uh, if it's getting done and the person is miraculously getting everything you had hoped and dreamed for that person done in 10 hours a week, well, maybe it doesn't matter. On the flip side, if, if the things aren't getting done consistently and, 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 and it almost doesn't matter whether someone's working hard, then, then you have a problem that you have to figure out and address collaboratively somehow, whatever that answer might be. Um, so I do think that um, um, managing to results, right, managing to outcomes, not inputs, um, is pretty important. Um, and, and that all starts with, with knowing, knowing what, you, what you want done and making clear requests. 
but it's a, it, it, it is, it is a, it is a challenging thing. And it's, and it's one of, I think the biggest challenges that we will face as managers. I'm certainly, I'm sure a lot of you feel the same way I do, which is a lot of the way I would manage is by walking around and I would kind of like, you know, stop by, like kind of see, see what people are up to generally, whether or not I'm stopping and having a conversation, generally see like, do people seem busy? How's the energy? Simon is my co-founder and, and Simon and I will often like, like have a quick chat at the end of the day and say, energy in the office seemed really good today, right? Or energy in the office seemed down. Did something happen? Are people okay? And those are things we take really seriously and we're completely blind right now. And we're doing our best to, to like get this through check-ins where we've implemented new meetings, but we are, we are flying a bit blind. So um, if people have figured this out, please write it in the comments. Uh, please share it with us. Uh, share it with me at paul at shortlist.net. I would love to hear, hear more. Thank you so much, Paul, for those great insights. The reviews that are coming in around the presentation are excellent. So we want to say a big thank you on behalf of IHRM for speaking to us about the art and science of building great teams. This will certainly not be the last time. So please um, allow us to reach out to you again in the future. Um, so that then we continue to share some of those tips and tricks that are working. Wonderful. Within now I understand. Rose, thank why you so much. Involved. Yeah. Sorry, go on. And everybody, I hope you, I hope you, I hope you all stay safe. I know it's a challenging time. Um, um, please do reach out. If there's anything you think we can do uh, um, to help, uh, um, we'd really like to support you all however we can, but best of luck. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Paul. And we love what you're doing around bringing the professionals together through this hub. We'll certainly reach out for some of those opportunities. Um, as I was saying, now I understand why Doris is also bubbly. I can see why the culture within shortlist seems, um, you know, one that is fun and engaging. So I want to say a big thank you. On behalf of IHRM, uh, the chairman, our ED, Irene, our head of secretariat, Fred, of course, Dan, who's always busy on the back end doing the social media, and our technology partner, Eric from Zalego. Thank you so much for all the time and all the effort that you've put into this webinar. We will be sharing the audio as well as the slides on the IHRM website, so please look out for that. And feel free to join us for our next webinar, which will be on 30th of April where we'll be having um, Stella Kiguta, who will be talking to us around communication in the age of crisis. How do we put people at the center? So Asante Nisana, keep safe and God bless. So you may now Asante. leave the webinar. It's your own pleasure. Thank you very much, Paul. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.